The Book of Job, Chapter 1 There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and five hundred she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, for Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? But there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not thine hand. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job, saying, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose, and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. The book of Job is absolutely, totally unique in the entire Bible. In that it has, it is constructed like a play, in a sense. The first two chapters are the introduction. They set the stage of the problem. We see we are introduced to Job. We are told what some of his blessings are. And then we see the beginnings of his world falling apart. All his wealth, all his family, all his comfort, everything else falling apart. And there doesn't seem to be any reason for it. He believes he's righteous. Nobody else does. Otherwise, they would, the bad things wouldn't happen to him. Verse, chapters 3 through to chapter 42, verse 6, is a long Hebrew poem. Now, the way it's translated into English is very nice, but it doesn't even come close to being as elegant as the Hebrew poetry does. And if you don't know Hebrew poetry, you won't appreciate that, but the, the English, to just understand, is not anywhere near as graceful. The last 11 verses in chapter 42 are sort of the final blessing of God on Job. And the whole book of Job has as its function to try to explain to people why bad things happen to righteous people. And it was a way 
for people to share a story that they could remember and memory was how things were transmitted in a way where they would learn not to judge how to deal with one another properly and honorably and to understand that the understanding of man is very rarely the same kind of understanding as God. And for this they use all kinds of, of uh, figurative things that aren't literal. For instance, Satan appearing before the Lord does not happen. Satan and, all, and one third of the heavenly host were cast out. They do not show up and make a bargain with God. Period. Does not happen. Okay. But for the purposes of the story, it's a convenient way to introduce a conflict between Satan being allowed, as he has to be allowed, because there needs to be some opposition in life, has to be allowed to influence people for bad, tempt them, if you will, cause problems, and the Lord to allow it, but and at the end of life, or after the judgment, the Lord to restore things as he did for Job. So we understand that there are a lot of literary devices here that you cannot take as literally true. This is a poem and a story for effect. Now, was Job a real person? There are arguments. I mean, if if you understood how petty and inconsequential and minor uh, some of the advice and some of the thought processes of some of the scholars were, you would marvel that these people have university degrees. <laughs> but there are huge arguments about whether or not Job was a real person, based on this word, or that concept, or this idea, or where this man came from, all the rest of it, or the fact that it was a poem. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether it was a poem, any more than it, if, you know, if you said, uh, well, there was a play written about Martin Luther King, for instance, or a movie done about Martin Luther King, or a song about Martin Luther King. Just because there was a poem, a story, a play written about Martin Luther King wouldn't mean Martin Luther King was not a real person. Him being a real person, or anybody for that matter, has nothing to do with whether or not somebody writes a play, a song, or a story about him, or makes a movie about him. Because things just are not connected. People, whoever put the story together, wanted to use a literary form to make sure that this was rememberable and memorable so that the people who heard the story, because this was a book all by itself. It was not part of anything else. It was put together in the Bible about 300 years after Christ's birth, 300 years after his death. And it had nothing to do with any other book. So it was a standalone item. And people would pick it up, uh, relate it, tell a story about it, and it was had a function to tell people that bad things do happen to good people. Don't judge. God will look after everything in the long run. And that's what it was for. And it does a very good job of that.